Hello and welcome to The Last Picture House, the podcast where we discuss classic films. I'm your host, Marcus Lovett, and joining me in our West Tokyo studios, regular gang member Maria Suzuki. Hi, Maria. Ciao. And a young buddy boy who wants to play nice, Garrett Diorio. <laughs> Thanks, Marcus. This episode, the 1961 film musical West Side Story. With a brilliant score by Leonard Bernstein, one-of-a-kind choreography by Jerome Robbins combining both ballet and jazz, not to mention witty lyrics by young Stephen Sondheim, the film is an enduring contender for best musical of all time. We'll take an in-depth look at how this retelling of Romeo and Juliet came to be, discuss what makes the film a fan favourite, and scrutinise whether or not it stands up for today's audiences. And if you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe on iTunes, Podcast Player, or your preferred podcasting app. With the coming release of Steven Spielberg's remake, we thought it would be an appropriate time to look back at the original 1961 West Side Story. And who better to help Maria and I pick apart the film than the person who sends me daily briefings on what concerts and operas are streaming online, Garrett Diorio. Garrett, you and I have spent a lot of time enthusing about music over the years, whether it be Bartok or Bowie, but are you into musicals? Uh, no. <laughs> Fair to say. Short answer, no. It's not to say that I, I hate musicals, but to me, first and foremost, it's about the music itself. And uh, that's not always the case with musicals. I think even people who write them, even the great Stephen Sondheim would said so, that it's often more about the plot and the storytelling with the music coming second. To me, that, that means the music often falls into a weird kind of liminal space between pop music and concert music that doesn't always work well. It can come off kind of cheesy. There are some, West Side Story is a great example, there are some musicals that have music that is great in its own right, mm. but I do often find myself thinking, I kind of prefer either a play or an opera, but this in-between space doesn't always work. How about you, Maria? Well, I am what you would call a plot-driven girl. So when they start singing, it's a little bit more difficult to follow for me. But and at the same time, as you may know, in Italy, everything is dubbed. So all the translations are also off-putting. But there is a moment that I kind of changed my mind when I saw, you know, 1996, Everyone Says I Love You, the musical parody by Woody Allen. That made me change a little bit my mind because I saw how the melodies of Cole Porter could come up in the action. From then on, I started to watch classic musicals. Do you have a favorite musical, Maria? Oh, absolutely. Singing in the Rain. That's a great choice. Singing in the Rain is great. It's got to be my favorite film musical, definitely. And I like that Maria mentioned Everyone Says I Love You before. Mm. I think comedies work well as musicals, and not many other genres do. So if not those, then maybe The Producers or Book of Mormon. Oh, the Producers is good, yes. And what about you? For me, it would be Three Penny Opera, The Vial. Oh, it has to be. Yeah, that, see, now this is a topic that I don't want to get us way off track, but like that always gets you into... You don't a, want us to go off track, Cap. Yeah, Come yeah, on. Yeah. Okay, I, I do. That's, <laughs> that's the only thing I live for. But the, um, what it, how do you define a musical exactly, which is always you know, what fits yeah, in. Yeah, and what's, a, what's, what's an, an operetta. operetta? Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if we're going to include that, then you win. That's great, yeah. And Garrett, is it fair to describe the musical as a particularly American art form? No and yes. I mean, in one sense, no, because obviously you can trace a pretty clear line back to the operetta or the singspiel or fundamentally isn't Zauberflota basically a musical? Yep. On the other hand, maybe yes in terms of what kind of themes get tackled. And maybe this is, you know, since we're speaking here very shortly after the, the passing of Stephen Sondheim, maybe that's his greatest influence is what kind of subject matter gets handled there. So to, to take his definition, the difference is where it's performed to the audience that you're performing for, which is, a, I think that came from an interview of his about 10 years ago where he said, an opera's performed in an opera house and a musical's performed in a theater. <laughs> <laughs> and it, as glib as that can sound, he has a point, which is it's the expectations that the audience brings to it, which is why you, you would say, well, if there are spoken lines in between, then clearly Zauber Flota is a musical, not an opera. But if you're trying to break it down to proportions, then you're losing all purpose. Is it a musical style? Well, then why is West Side Story a musical, not an opera? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in terms of it, I think that niche that maybe West Side Story kind of begins in a big way of using a fundamentally comic art form to sometimes try to tackle serious subjects, that's American, I think. That's a great answer. As usual, this episode is going to be spoiler heavy. So we strongly suggest you watch and listen to West Side Story before you listen to the show. Thank you. 
As a dancer choreographer with America's best known ballet troupe, Ballet Theatre, Jerome Robbins shot to fame in the early 1940s with Bernstein collaborations Fancy Free and On the Town. In 1949, Robbins conceived of a musical retelling of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Maria, it was originally going to be called East Side Story, wasn't it? Well, actually, the working title until up the rehearsals was Gangway. And the initial concept belongs to Robbins, who talks about being approached by an actor friend during a party on Fire Island. So his friend was offered the role of Romeo. But he found the role to be very passive and asked Robbins for advice on how to play it. And that made Robbins imagine if the story was set in modern times. And they gave him the idea of a modern Romeo and Juliet and the Montags as Catholic and the Capulets as Jewish. So the action would take place over Easter Passover in Lower East Side of Manhattan. And Robbins will later identify this actor friend as Montgomery Clift. We don't have any evidence, but I think it's a pretty fascinating story. So a very enthusiastic Robbins gathered two of his friends in his house to talk about his new idea. Arthur Lawrence, playwright and screenwriter, and composer and conductor Leonard Bernstein. Lawrence recalls that night in his autobiography, Original Story by Arthur Lawrence, a memoir of Broadway and Hollywood, published in 2000. He says, at the first meeting at Jerry's, all three of us overlapped one another blathering excitedly, bubbling with ideas, stumbling over the obstacle Lenny always put in the way. He (laughs) wanted to write an American opera. So, Garrett, for those unfamiliar with his work, who was Leonard Bernstein? Well, he did want to write the Great American Opera. That was probably the unfinished goal throughout his career. But he was the first great world-renowned American conductor, is probably what he was most famous for. Did a lot of uh, lectures kind of introducing classical music. He was very much in a populist vein, kind of like Copland was. Not so much in his music writing, although that too, but in his desire to democratize music. So it's important to remember, I think, that his rise to fame occurred at the time of serialism and 12-tone music and atonality, which continued, I think, through the 1970s, where if you were a a music student, you were required to write 12-tone music. And there was almost a reaction (laughs) against, like, how dare you have a melody that people could sing? And Bernstein was very much in opposition to that and thought the tonality, he tried early in his career academically to somehow prove that tonality was this human instinct, which seems intuitive to us. It kind of is. People like a melody. People like a tune. There's a reason that nobody except me goes to 12-tone concerts. Well, (laughs) and and me. Right, and you. You know, it's very much part of the, Mm -hmm. what was going on in theater more broadly, right? Break it. You know, modernism is all about breaking it. Right, right. So and, and striving for the new. Right. I think what probably attracted Bernstein to an idea like West Side Story is that he wrote his undergraduate thesis at Harvard in 1939 about trying to include what he what at the time were called race elements in formal music, but wanted to create a distinctly American vernacular that would be tonal and rhythmically driven and include elements from American folk music in the way that you know, Bartok had done in, in Hungary, for example. And the irony is that, that that kind of had started in the 1890s with the Czech, Dvorak of all people, but never really caught on in the States until the post-war era. So Bernstein was a big driving force in that. And to this day, I think West Side Story is probably his most recognized music. I think so. It continued through his life to I mean, what, pale what you, What's it competing with, Candy? Well, yeah, the overture to Candide, at least, is a commonly performed piece. I I think his score for On the Waterfront is pretty recognized, even if people don't know what it is. It doesn't always work as a score. Bernstein didn't do anything in the background (laughs) at all, ever, which is probably why he wasn't a big (laughs) film composer. Within the world of, I think, people who listen to classical music and would go to those concerts, there are other pieces that come up, but nothing even remotely on the scale of West Side Story. One of his assistants, Charlie Harmon, one of his last assistants, wrote a memoir about his time with Bernstein in the 80s and mentions an anecdote of being in a restaurant in L.A., I think 1984, and Maria comes on in the background, and Bernstein kind of says, well, that's lunch paid for, with the, the joke being at the same time that he was kind of tired of it, <laughs> but also at the same time, the other joke is, Harmon points out, the idea that Bernstein knew how much anything cost was funny. <laughs> but, al- but also, he was writing to his own brother, mm. who was probably in Puerto Rico, and saying, oh, you know, Maria is going to get me to the jukebox. Cool, not so much. So he was, he was aware of how commercial some songs could be. 
And West Side Story, Maria, was stuck in development hell for a long time, wasn't it? Yeah, it was for about five years. The subject uh, was kind of put to bed because Lawrence was not so interested in the religious feud and Bernstein as well. And so they came to Robbins with another project, with, which was Serenade, but Robbins was not interested in that either. So I think the turning point was when Lawrence and Bernstein met again in Los Angeles, in no other place, by the pool at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and they were talking about different things, other things. And Bernstein spied at the headlines of LA Times, Los Angeles Times, that was talking about gang riots. So he had the idea of connecting the dots. So making Robin's project about West Side instead of East Side and about the recent arrivals from Puerto Rico opposing descendants of earlier immigrants from Europe. Lawrence would say it would have Latin passion, immigrant anger and share resentment. Just as we were about to record the show, we learned about the death of the film's lyricist, Stephen Sondheim, without doubt one of the greats of American theater. Aside from West Side Story, he would go on to write the lyrics for another Lawrence script, Gypsy, and compose both music and wrote the lyrics for Company, Sweeney Todd, Into the Woods, and Assassins. Garrett, how did Sondheim become involved in the project? Well, there's an interesting anecdote, and I don't know how true it is, but uh, Maria mentioned Serenade, uh, a musical that was supposed to be adapted from a uh, James M. Kame novel, who's kind of known as a noir novelist. He's often lumped in exactly. with, with Chandler. Yeah. but. Uh, Serenade is, is more of a love story, but also about like the travails of coming up through show business. It centers on a young singer. On a young opera singer that found out that he is gay. In the musical, right. In right. the musical, yes. So this is, and this is t- considering that it's Bernstein, Sondheim, Lorenz, these guys in there that uh, wasn't spoken at the time, but that's obviously an undercurrent to a lot of the work. So apparently when that was in production, Sondheim was in his early 20s working on Saturday, which hadn't been picked up or produced. And Lorenz auditioned him, and Sondheim played some music from Saturday, and Lorenz said that he liked the lyrics and the music less so, and that offended Sondheim, and so they didn't work together. Later on, when the idea for West Side Story came up, Sondheim apparently was, again, not so keen on the idea of being a lyricist. He wanted to write the music as well, Mm -hmm. but his mentor and family friend Oscar Hammerstein convinced him that it could be a good thing for him, and that, you know, hey, somebody wants to hire you for a big show to write the lyrics, do it. And it can't hurt to have that experience. Mm. Sondheim would say that he hasn't been that poor and had never even known a Puerto Rican. So he was very not convinced about doing this. <laughs> and it's telling that later in his career, Sondheim did point out that he was less than satisfied with a lot of the lyrics from the show, saying particularly he would bring up uh, I Feel Pretty and saying, how can I put these internal rhyme schemes alarmingly charming in the mouth of Maria, who's supposed to be you know, fresh off the boat in this immigrant I mean, he kind of has a point. It does stand out. It doesn't quite fit. On the other hand, how much verisimilitude do you want in a musical about gangs, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the musical premiered on Broadway on September 26, 1957, and played for 732 performances. Writing in the New York Herald Tribune, theatre critic Walter Kerr said director, choreographer and idea man Jerome Robbins has put together and then blasted apart the most savage, restless, electrifying dance patterns we've been exposed to in a dozen seasons. The New York Times wrote that everything in West Side Story is of a piece. Everything contributes to the total impression of wildness, ecstasy and anguish. Maria, how did the musical transition into a film? So the musical was very successful, so successful that in three months it was the go-to musical. But at the same time, it was a musical that was not so common for the time because it, it didn't have female central character and it didn't have a big star. So when it comes to making it into a film, if we think that My Fair Lady was sold to Warner for $5.5 million dollars, this one was sold to not even a big production, like a independent company like Seven Arts Production for $350,000. So people were not very certain that it would make a hit. 
as a movie. Essential to making West Side Story into a movie was the Mirish Company. It was an independent organization producing films for release by United Artists. And they were also responsible for Billy Wilder's Some Like It Hot yeah. and uh, The Apartment. Mm. So in particular, Walter Mirish was very keen on having Robbins on board. As choreographer, director and chief author of the musical, there was never any real doubt that Robbins would oversee the making of the film. But given his lack of film experience, the studio paired him as director with veteran filmmaker Robert Wise. Robbins would be responsible for the dance sequences while Wise would shoot the dialogue. Wise was, on paper, an odd choice to co-direct the movie. Those of you who listened to episode 19 of the podcast will remember Wise as the editor of both Citizen Kane and The Magnificent Ambersons. Having overseen the studio's editing, Wells might say butchering, of Ambersons while Wells was shooting It's All True in Brazil, Wise would make the transition to director. Starting out with a series of genre picks for RKO, he would go on to make a name for himself with science fiction, in particular The Day the Earth Stood Still. Seven years later, he would show his versatility, directing the melodrama I Want to Live, about a prostitute sentenced to death for murder. Susan Hayworth would go on to win the Oscar for Best Actress for that movie. So this versatility would come at a price. Wise was forever tagged as a journeyman director, someone whose films lacked a specific voice. But uh, he was a very good candidate in terms of the production company because his reputation was of staying in or even under budget. Also, he was famously easygoing and genuinely a nice person. So he was well liked in the industry. He was a very meticulous person, very careful he's, for detail. He's an <laughs> and he is famous for his painstaking documentation. You mentioned I Want to Live, in which Susan Hayward's character is executed. Wise actually attended a real execution. Well, if he's likable at all, too, that could be an important role for him being alongside Robbins, who is notoriously not likable, right? Yeah, maybe more demanding is, is the way I would put it. But <laughs> seems like people hated him, <laughs> admired him, but like you, you don't, you never hear anything unqualified nice about him. I really like what Rita Moreno said. She said he could smell a victim from miles away. <laughs> he was famous for, uh, let's say, sadistic streak. Yes. When it came to casting, the filmmakers had to not only find performers who could sing and dance, but also bankable stars. Maria, who did they turn to? Both Robbins and Wise were very keen on the king, Elvis. Maria, turn right. There would be a different tune, right? (laughs) But apparently his manager, the very controlling Colonel Tom Parker, said no, because Elvis should never play a guy who would kill the brother of his girlfriend. Basically, I think they audition every actor between 17 and 30. Possible candidates for Tony were Tony Curtis, Paul Newman, Anthony Perkins, Robert Wagner, who at the time was married to Natalie Wood, and even a very young Peter Falk. They Pete. passed on all of those guys and got with <laughs> I mean, I don't want to... I don't want to bag too much on, on Richard Bayman. Right, Richard Bayman. Especially considering that he himself has said that it was not his best work. He was young, didn't quite know what he was getting into. His performance to me is that of someone who is struggling with the directions he's getting, whether he's getting different directions from Wise and, and Robbins, I don't know. But he, he really looks like he's stuck. More and more, I'm convinced, probably Bamer and Natalie Wood herself, there was a bit of, because since we're in Japan, the Johnny's thing going on. Mm, yeah. You are going to cast this person because this is who we want and he needs a role. Exactly. And, That's exactly what it looks uh, like. And, uh, you know, you really see the star system at work in this film. Right. Whether or not the performance is up to par in the end is irrelevant. Mm. The important point is who's on the poster. Well, now we've learned about West Side Story's pre-production, let's get into the plot. The film starts with a jolt as the orchestra plays an overture. This is done over an abstract image, vertical lines with a background that changes from one bold color to another. As the piece comes to an end, the title West Side Story appears, and the abstract lines fade to reveal the Manhattan skyline. After some high-angle helicopter shots of the city below, the action moves to a neighborhood basketball court. The Jets, a gang of white street kids, are loitering beside the court and clicking their fingers to the rhythm of the prologue. They strut and sway to the rhythm of the music, and as it builds, the Jets' movements become less restrained until finally the gang leap and fly through the air. The music of the prologue continues, 
When the Jets come across a Puerto Rican teen, Bernardo, played by George Chiquiris, they taunt him before eventually letting him go. The camera now follows Bernardo as he's joined by two members of his own gang, the Sharks. As the three pass a grocery store, they catch two members of the Jets stealing from the boxes outside. Outnumbered, the Jets walk away to the taunts of the Sharks. Here, the power dynamic reverses yet again when the two Jets are joined by the rest of their gang. The Jets now chase the Sharks down the street. The prologue ends back on the basketball court with a final confrontation between the two rival gangs. As the two groups fight one another, a police whistle blows. Lieutenant Shrank, Simon Oakland, the senior cop on the beat, and the uniformed officer Kropke, William Bramley, arrive on the scene to break up the fight. Shrank asks one of the Jets which of the Puerto Rican kids bloodied him. The Jets leader, Riff, Russell Tamblin, is wise to Shrank's tactics and sarcastically says that a cop started the fight. Now angry, Shrank tells the boys, you hoodlums don't own these streets. Bernardo and the Sharks play along with Riff's story. Would you mind translating that into Spanish? Get your friends out of here, Bernardo. The Sharks move off and Shrank returns his attention to the Jets. Start making nice with the PR kids, because if you don't, and I catch any of you doing any more brawling in my territory, I'm going to personally beat the living crud out of each and every one of you and see that you go to the can and rot there. Community policing at its best. The cops leave, and Riff reminds the rest of the Jets that they'd beaten back other gangs, the Emeralds and the Hawks, and this would be no different. So what are we going to do, hey buddy boys? We're going to clean up once and for all so the Sharks never set foot in our turf again. One all-out fight. The talk turns to weapons. They say blades, I say blades. They say guns, I say guns. Riff decides on a war council with Bernardo. Action wants to join Riff as his second, but Riff tells him that Tony will always be his second. Action complains that Tony doesn't belong no more, not since he took some lousy, stinking job. Riff defends Tony, singing, Once you're a jet, you're a jet all the way from your first cigarette to your last dying day. At the end of the song, Riff tells the Jets that he'll seek out Bernardo at the dance being held that evening at the gym. The rest of the gang should dress sharp and be there at 10. This is one of the parts I like best. I like it when every element in an art form does its job, right? So, you know, you have the sitcoms where people are sitting on a couch talking. Yeah. I hate those. Why is that not a radio show? The visual <laughs> element is doing no work, right? Right. So if you have a visual element, it needs to do work. Just like when you're making a presentation, right? Your slides need to be doing something that your mouth is not. So the prologue is like that. They let the, you're going to have the dance, you're going to have the ballet, and we can come to later whether that's a way to tell a gang story. But a lot is revealed without anybody saying it at first. It's a musical, so they blow that later and they tell you exactly what they're doing. The Jet song kind of ruins that, <laughs> spelling out things. We're going to have a fight. Oh, people yeah, in the it's, gang it, it's, it's sung it's exposition. Right. And musicals love their exposition to be as easy as possible, right? I love that the prologue is kind of set, setting things out, introducing you to the world, introducing you to the story, introducing you to the characters all through the ballet. Yeah. Without them necessarily having dialogue do that job. Now the action cuts to Doc's drugstore, where Riff is asking BFF Tony to come to the dance and the war council. Tony is reluctant. He's done with that life and goes on to tell Riff that every single night for the past month, he's woken up reaching out for something, but he can't say exactly what it is. It's the kind of kick I used to get from being a jet, you know? Despite Tony's protests, Riff manages to convince him to come to the dance, if only because Riff already promised the jets Tony would show. Riff leaves Tony, who then sings about this mysterious feeling he's having, the song Something's Coming. The scene moves to a bridal store where two young Puerto Rican women are arguing over alterations being made to a dress. Maria, Natalie Wood, wants her friend Anita, Rita Moreno, to make what had been her communion dress into something more revealing. Well, my communion dress was that of a nun, so it would be a little bit difficult to make it revealing. It's now to be a dress for dancing, no longer for praying. Anita reminds Maria that Bernardo, her boyfriend and Maria's brother, made Anita promise not to make the dress too short. Maria questions why Bernardo even brought her to America. To marry Chino, replies Anita knowingly. It quickly becomes clear that Maria doesn't have any feelings for her intended. And just as an aside, if I had to pick one scene that dates the movie, this would have to be it. Between the leaden dialogue, Wood's caricatured performance, the Virginia white dress, total lack of dramatic stakes or real chemistry between the performers, it must have felt dated even when the film first premiered. 
The scene is only saved by Anita's flirting with Bernardo when he and Chino, Jose de Vega, arrive to take the girls to the dance. I like this twist on, I don't want to say improving on Romeo and Juliet, because who, <laughs> who's going to improve on Shakespeare? Right. I like this twist on having Anita play a little bit of the nurse, but she's not the nurse anymore, but she's fulfilling that role, right? She's the advisor. She's the, the older voice there a little bit for Maria, who's very much Juliet, obviously. And it brings everything, including the elimination of the parents from entirely, into the youth realm, which I think accentuates and makes the story stronger. Because in Romeo and Juliet, other than the weird quarrel between the parents and kind of the house divided part, yeah. everything in the plot advances through one central theme, which is teenagers need to calm the fuck down. <laughs> like if they could just chill for a minute, there would be no issue, right? Everything that happens happens because they're Damn impulsive. Kids. Right, exactly. Damn kids are too impulsive. And West Side Story accentuates that by putting everything in the youth realm. It's youth gangs that are the division, not some feud between families or something. And I think that works and makes the story more powerful in a way. There's a wonderfully unexpected psychedelic transition to the gym where the dance is taking place. The Jets and their partners are on the dance floor swinging to a big band number. When Bernardo, Anita, Maria and the other Puerto Ricans arrive, the music stops and the Jets move to one side of the hall, the Sharks to the other. The air is thick with tension. Gladhand, a social worker, an uncredited John Aston, who you'll remember as Gomez Adams, and Officer Kropke attempt to take control of the scene. Tonight, kids, we're going to do something special. We're going to have a get-together dance. Boys that have formed one circle and girls another. Not surprisingly, the boys and girls associated with either the Jets or the Sharks end up having to dance with each other at random, ignoring protocol, Bernardo reaches past the jet girls in front of him and takes Anita's hand, and Riff does the same with his girlfriend, Velma. Gladhand and Kropke look on as the two groups disown the rules and begin dancing with their own friends to a frenetic mambo, one of the musical highlights in a film full of them. Tony now appears at the entrance to the gym. As the music continues, he and Maria make eye contact and the rest of the dancers disappear into a blur. The pair share a few words and a kiss before reality returns in the form of Bernardo's pushing Tony away from his sister. There's only one thing they want from a Puerto Rican girl. Bernardo warns Tony to stay away from his sister and tells Chino to take her home. Come, Maria. The scene ends with Riff and Bernardo agreeing to meet at docks at midnight for the war council. As the rest of the dancers recede into the background, Tony sings of having met the most beautiful girl ever and sings... Maria. Maria. Which, lyrically, this is my favorite part of the whole show. It's so simple. He's just repeating the name, riffing on it over and over again. But it works really well, in, almost in the way that an operatic aria would, right? You're not so much worried about trying to advance plot or story. Yeah, they're, they're, we're not pushing anything other than the internal emotions of the character. So you could imagine it being almost a tenor aria, couldn't you? Right. And it, it also works because he's a teenage boy, right? And what does he know about her other than her name? Nothing. So it works in that way that he's just saying but, her name over and over again. But very famously, Robbins would say to Sondheim, what is Tony doing? He's like, he's just saying the name. He, he was so nervous about it. He said, you stage it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, yeah, Sondheim was right on this one. <laughs> the, uh, however off he, he might have later felt he was with I Feel Pretty, he hit it with that one. Well, let's start talking about that opening, the overture. I kind of wish at the start of the film they'd done what the Coens did with Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? and had a credit story by Shakespeare in giant letters. <laughs> Between the 70 mil widescreen, the inventive choreography and the rhythmic intervals they're singing, I absolutely love that opening. And that whole opening is, of course, shot on location. I think it's shot around somewhere close to the Met, right? The Met wasn't yet built, but the... Yeah, it's just the, northwest of it. But. The Upper West Side, that whole area in the late 50s, very soon after West Side Story, 19 59 is when ground was broken for what is today Lincoln Center, which is where the Met is, yeah. Yeah, let's say that the magic of editing cover uh, pretty much four miles distance. One location was the basketball court on 110th Street, and the other location were the tenements at 68th Street. Yeah, I don't think there are tenements in 68th anymore. No, no, not anymore. No, it's, it's a very wealthy area. <laughs> and talking about how Wise was meticulous, he negotiated with the contractor in order to have that part of the buildings destroyed the latest. Delay the buildings that to, he wanted in the back of his shot. Yeah, exactly. Wise was very hands-on for the location scouting. 
both for the aerial shot and for the prologue shot. For the aerial shot, he took his assistant director on a helicopter mm. and he was plunging from the helicopter to But get hanging out the, the side. Yes, and while his assistant was was grabbing his belt. I watched that opening again today and those shots really do work. It feels like we're kind of pushing in. It's that trick of You yeah. know, having the long establishing shot and then feels like we're moving closer and closer. And I like the fact that every dancer slowly gets into the dance, you know, the snapping of the fingers and then by the end is all dancing. I like how it ge- it goes to layers. There was one take eye level, one take from the crane and one take they dig some holes mm-hmm. in the ground and they put the camera in. And they were done multiple, multiple times. And of course, the dancers had to do warm up. So they were doing warm up on the street with everyone watching. And they had actual street. So they, were, dan- they had an audience, in other words. Yes. A lot of the dancers recall the fact that they felt a little bit shy about doing that because they were doing ballet. They were supposed to play gang members and they were doing like plie and stuff. And they used real street gang kids to guarantee some peace in the area. Apparently, the West Side gangs in New York in the 50s didn't dance. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them actually wanted to start dancing, they say. Uh, uh, what's interesting that that site interests me so much that it was filmed on the, the location that would later become Lincoln Center because the 50s at a time, and I think well, West, close by at least, yeah. Right. West Side Story was a kind of big return to the mainstream for Leonard Bernstein, who had been throughout his life uh, kind of a devotee of leftist politics. And because it's the 50s, There's HUAC going on, the un-American activities. Robbins was actually a member of the Communist Party at one point. Right, right. I forget if I don't want to... And an informer. Yeah. And he, he, he named names. Yeah, he named names. Another reason for people to hate him. Right? You're an <laughs> asshole and you name names. It's a good thing he was good at what he did. <laughs> But, uh, Bernstein, <laughs> was a, Bernstein was quietly blacklisted and had his passport suspended in 1953. And it never really became public. But he had a really quick about face for a few reasons. One is that he was friends with John F. Kennedy who was a senator at the time, and helped him get back in the mainstream. That I didn't know. Very good friends, yeah. Stayed at the White House, was a friend of Jackie Onassis afterwards, hung out with Kennedy's kids. So he was a good friend. They're both from Boston, right? And everybody from Boston knows each other. Of course. <laughs> But the, uh, <laughs> this return for Bernstein, so he does West Side Story, and they have trouble getting it picked up as a stage musical mm. at first. 1953, his passport's suspended. The State Department thinks he might be dangerous. 1957, he's putting on this big show. And then by 1959, after West Side Story, He conducts the concert, Fanfare for the Common Man, Aaron Copeland, gay communist, of all things, for Dwight Eisenhower, who was president when he was blacklisted, to break ground for Lincoln Center, right? So this is, <laughs> what an about face. What a, what a decade for that guy, right? <laughs> so. When you were talking, Maria, about the audience on the side of the street, I mean, it made me wonder what they made of all the makeup that everyone was wearing. Oh, you mean like the Max Factor 50 and above Festa? <laughs> <laughs> That is this film? <laughs> Do you want to explain for the listeners a little bit about the way in which the Puerto Rican characters were made up? Yes, I would use the word of um, a scholar Francis Negro Montaner, who in Boricua Pop, Puerto Ricans and the Latinization of American Culture says that in order to make the audience understand that it's a Puerto Rican character, the two things were needed, makeup and an accent. That's why she also noted that the blondness of the Jets is enhanced. Can you notice yeah, that there are absolutely. like unnaturally blonde? Also, Rita Moreno would say that she would have the Rita Moreno box, which was like a shoe box with some mud-like foundation that was brown or darker, some hoop earring and a wig. There was a very stereotypical characterization that allegedly the audience immediately understand that we were in front of a Puerto Rican character, especially for George Chakiris. George Chakiris was playing riff in the London production. So audience needed to distinguish him as a Puerto Rican, as a shark. It was important that he was wearing very brown makeup. May I also remind you that 1961 is the year of Breakfast at Tiffany's with the famous... Oh, no, 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 no. You're not going to do that, are you? <laughs> Mr. Yuniyoshi. Mr. Yuniyoshi. No. No, meaning that I mean, yes. the representation was, so not, you're, you're, you're was saying not a very important... Well done for bringing in whataboutism. <laughs> yeah, what about... <laughs> Truman Capone. <laughs> What about Breakfast at Tiffany's? I think that's probably the worst 
example that you could possibly come well, up with. Well, because that was intentionally offensive. In yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's funny because well, West Side Story at the time, it was supposed to be on the forefront of these issues. And I think all, well, of, the exactly. guys, and all it, the guys involved would be, would be really upset to every, learn how it's In every now, yeah. other way, yeah. it's quite clear that this is a piece that is trying to do good. And it's got the best ideals, but just... In no, terms of I execution, think... they're still stuck in 1961. I guess the idea here is that from the studio point of view, you want to quickly signal to the audience what is going on, who is being represented. Now, I'm not making excuses for it. I'm just saying it's incredibly heavy handed, but you want to quickly be able to recognize people as they dance across the stage. And that's what the studios obviously do. And in fact, at the risk of maybe offending particularly Sondheim devotees, like musical theater is not a genre of subtlety, right? No, it's, it's, it's quick never signaling, been. very very over the top trope. So it's it's melodrama, it's exaggeration, and that extends to all parts of it. Some of those obviously age really badly. It look from our point of view now look really offensive. And especially a big production like this had to have very simplified chords. But there's more, of course, that you can burrow into. I mean, the way musically that the two groups, the Jets and the Sharks, are represented. So the Jets, you get, and I love the irony of this, jazz, this big band sound that, that of course, comes from African-American culture. And then the pan-Americanism of the Sharks, right? They're represented in one sequence by a genuinely Puerto Rican idiom. But the rest of the time, it's Mexico. It's all over the shop. Right. Well, that's true. There's a, a kind of broadly Latin sound rather than specifically Puerto Rican. Um, it's a lot more Cuban than anything else. In right, right. Music, yeah. But a step forward for its time, right? That's the Both thing. Both musically I, yeah, and... I, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. It is absolutely a step forward. But watching it now, of course, you know, you cannot help but be taken aback. Garrett, the Jets are meant to be immigrants too, right? Well, they're Catholic, and that's important. So the, as Maria mentioned, the first iteration of the show before it got produced was going to have uh, Catholic, mainly Italian immigrants and Jewish because they were th- the idea came up in the, the early 40s. So by the 50s, that had changed a bit. Um, and having you know, the Jewish immigrant and, ca- and Italian immigrant was less salient. But it's worth pointing out that at the time in the 50s, the idea of a you know, Eastern European or Southern European Catholics being white was not a given. The definition of whiteness changes quite a bit. I mean, I often joke about myself that I'm I'm third generation American, maybe second generation undisputedly white. (laughs) So there's a bit of the the idea of Catholicism itself in the 50s in America. That was another outside group. The Jets are also the children of immigrants. It's also interesting to me how they went away from religion as the the two gangs being, you know, religious gangs Mm. and figured that, you know, no, we need to do this more on kind of nationalist grounds, that there's the Puerto Ricans and there's the Americans. There's a and that, to, that seems terribly relevant today. Right. There's an well in the in the movie, especially playing up the blondness. Like, why would they have been blonde? Like, the, but there's a need to simplify too. You need the story to be instantly recognizable, and you don't need intersectionality in a musical, at least not in the fifties. All right. So let's move on to part two of the plot. Now home in her apartment, Maria stares dreamily out her window while Bernardo lectures her. I do not say these things to spoil your evening or to hear myself talk. I am here longer than you, Maria. Some day, when you are an old married woman with five children, you can tell me what to do. But right now, it's the other way around. Now go to bed. Anita appears unimpressed by Bernardo's chauvinism and follows him out of Maria's bedroom. You know she has a mother, also a father. Girls here are free to have fun. She is in America now. The couple make their way to the apartment building's roof, where the sharks still dress for the dance are waiting. Bernardo tells his friends that after tonight, things will be settled. They talk about the unfairness of America. They are treated poorly, while Pollacks, like Tony, are treated with respect. Anita begins to sing. Puerto Rico, my heart's devotion, let it sink back into the ocean. Of course, this is one of the film's best-known songs, America. This, for me, is maybe the highlight of the show, that the rhythmic complexity that opens it up brings in that kind of Latin feel that's supposed to be there. And every musical has to have the part where the orchestra can just crank it out and get loud, and it's fun, and America's just a blast, right? If you're going to remember one tune, I'm going to be thinking about this all night. Now, after we record this, America's going to be stuck in my head for days. And it's a, it's a welcome earworm. It's a, it's a great, great piece of music. The level and complexity, not only of the music, but the dance here is incredible. I believe that this is one of the sequences that Robbins 
No, America was choreographed by Peter Gennaro, uh, whom Robbins thought was more experienced in Latin dances. It's time to leave for the War Council. Anita tries to convince Bernardo to stay by suggesting they meet later alone on the roof, but Bernardo counters that he will do both. Anita replies, I'm an American girl now. I don't wait. Bernardo and the other sharks leave and we return to Maria's room, where she is getting ready for bed. On the street beneath Maria's fire escape, Tony appears and starts calling out her name, Maria. He asks her to come down, but she says that her mother and father will wake up. He tells her that he's going to come up to her. After a pointed reminder that their relationship status is doomed, your father will like me. No, he is like Bernardo, afraid. The star-crossed lovers sing the duet tonight. Maria's father calls out to her, and she tells Tony she must leave. I love you, Tony tells her. They agree to meet the next day at the bridal shop where Maria works. At the drugstore, the Jets wait for the sharks to arrive. Tomboy anybody's Susan Oakes, asks to join in the rumble, but Riff refuses to let her fight. Officer Kropke arrives on the scene in a squad car and asks the Jets what they're doing hanging out in front of Doc's store. Riff tells him that they are afraid of going home. Such a bad environment, Ice backs him up. We don't get no love there. They continue that if they aren't allowed to stay out on the street, they're liable to turn into a bunch of juvenile delinquents. Kropke is called back to the squad car and he and his partner drive off. The gang now begins to role-play Kropke hauling kids in front of social workers, psychiatrists and judges, singing Officer Kropke. While this song was added for the film and doesn't do anything to advance the plot, I'd argue it contains some of Sondheim's wittiest lyrics. Russ Hamblin, his actual voice, gets to sing Our mothers all are junkies, our fathers all are drunks, golly, Moses, naturally we're punks. Doc wanders out to see what the kids are doing in front of the store. He asks where Tony got to. He was supposed to help Doc clean up. The Jets tell Doc that they're having a war council to discuss weapons for the rumble. Doc is unimpressed. Fighting over a little piece of street is so important? Dig yourself an early grave. Bernardo and his lieutenants arrive for the war council, and Riff tells Doc to kick it. Bernardo sits down to discuss terms. He agrees the fight will take place tomorrow, after dark, under the highway. At that moment, Tony bursts through the door, calling for the Doc. The two gangs continue to discuss what weapons will be allowed. Tony chides them and says that if they have the guts, it should be a fair fight. The best fighter from each gang slugs it out. Bernardo agrees, presuming that he will fight Tony, but the Jets insist they pick their own fighter. At that moment, a lookout whistles to let them know that Shrank has arrived to break up the meeting. The boys do their best to look casual. In a clever bit of social commentary, Shrank tells them it's great that the two gangs have resolved their feud. You know, headquarters hears about this, I may even get a promotion. Good deal all around, hey Bernardo? I get a promotion, and you Puerto Ricans get what you've been itching for. Use of the playground, use of the gym, the streets, the candy store. So what if they do turn this town into a stinking pigsty? Bernardo leaps out of his chair, but Shrank shouts, clear out you. Oh yeah, I know, it's a free country, and I ain't got the right. But I got a badge. What do you got? Beat it. The sharks leave, whistling God Save the Queen. Shrank turns back to the Jets. Okay, fellas, where's the rumble going to be? Tony tries to intervene, but Shrank tells him to shut his mouth. Shrank continues, saying that he's for the Jets. They can help him to clean up the town. When nobody answers, he again becomes angry. Don't worry, I'll find out where it's going to be, so be sure to finish each other off. It's worth mentioning here what a truly great bad lieutenant Shrank is. A lot of this is down to Simon Oakland's note-perfect performance. All but Tony and the Doc leave. Tony tells the Doc that from now on, everything is going to be all right. I can feel it. Tony explains to the Doc that he's met a girl and bids Doc buenas noches. Now understanding, the Doc tells Tony to be careful. After an intermission, we return once again to the bridal shop. Maria sings to her co-workers about how happy she feels. The song, I Feel Happy. Yes, it's a great song, but Natalie Wood still seems out of place in this scene. The owner, Madame Lucia, comes in and tells the girls it's closing time and they should leave. Maria says she will tidy up. Anita is about to go when Tony arrives. Understanding what's happening, Anita leaves, telling Maria that she had better be home in 15 minutes. Tony embraces Maria and says not to worry. Anita likes this. Maria says that Anita is worried and asks if Tony is going to the rumble that evening. Maria tells him he should go and stop it. Any fight is no good for us. 
The film now threatens to put the audience into a diabetic coma as the lovers roleplay their wedding in amongst the marriage gowns. Together they sing One Hand, One Heart. This might sound hyperbolic at first, but bear with me. Right? One of the things that makes Mozart so great, this is the oh, hyperbolic that, 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 that's, that's where you're going, one. okay. Right. <laughs> is that when you listen to Mozart, and I'm sure you've noticed, I know you've noticed this, Marcus, you probably have too, Maria. Mozart will come up with a great melody, a melody that any other composer would kill for. He'll use it once in the middle of a piece and then just discard it. Never mm. come back to it. Doesn't develop it. Doesn't come back to it. Because he could, he could just have as many as he wanted. And he's maybe unique in that way mm. in, in all of composer history as far as we know. And this is one of those. This is one of the things I really like about West Side Story. It's one Hand, One Heart is one of those melodies. It can work in any genre, right? Uh, you could imagine this on an operatic stage. It works in a musical. You can imagine it as a pop song in its own right. It's beautifully done, but it's brief, and they don't come back it's to it. It's a very short song. I yeah. think in the hands of a lesser composer... They would have come back to this again. It, there would have been two, three reprises. They would have hit it at the end with a full orchestra on the right. horns and just destroyed it, taken everything in a way that made it work. That beautiful, simple moment is there, and it, it, it works wonderfully, and it's a great, just a great piece. Originally, apparently, this was written to be where tonight is, but they thought it was a little bit too chaste, too pure. And I, I think it, it was and, Hammerstein that gave them that, that so, advice, yeah. yeah. The scene moves on to an energetic montage, the Tonight Quintet. In effect, it's the Broadway musical equivalent of the gearing up montage in a Hollywood action film. Mixed in with the Jets and the Sharks preparing for the rumble and the couple singing about their love for one another, there's also Anita singing about her day with Bernardo after the rumble. The Sharks are the first to arrive at the site for the rumble. They are quickly joined by Riff and the other Jets. Ice and Bernardo begin to fight while the other boys egg them on from the sidelines. Tony runs toward them and calls for them to hold it. Bernardo says that maybe Tony has finally decided to fight his own battles. Tony replies that none of them need to fight. He holds out his hand for Bernardo to shake on it, but Bernardo punches him away. Bernardo continues to taunt Tony. Afraid, pretty boy? Bernardo comes at Tony when his back is turned and kicks him. Riff takes a swing at the shark's leader and the two gang leaders begin to slug it out. As Bernstein's music for the rumble begins, the two boys produce knives. Tony tries to stop the fight, but Ice pulls him away. This spectacular scene ends brutally, with Bernardo stabbing Riff. As the Jets' leader falls, Tony comes to his aid. While Bernardo contemplates what he's done, Tony takes the knife from Riff and stabs Bernardo. An all-out melee ensues before the boys run at the sound of an approaching siren. A wounded Tony drags himself to Bernardo, but it's too late to save either him or Riff. Anybody pulls Tony away before the police arrive. We now return to Maria, who is dancing alone on the roof of her apartment building. The dreamy lyricism of this scene ends suddenly with the arrival of a wounded Chino. Maria asks if he's been fighting. He tells her about the rumble. Maria is shocked, saying the rumble wasn't meant to take place. Maria pleads with Chino just to say what happened, and he tells her that Bernardo was stabbed with a knife. Maria immediately asks after Tony. Chino cannot hold back any longer and shouts, He killed your brother. Chino runs from the roof and Maria gives chase. Why are you lying? She screams. Maria then overhears her neighbor saying that Bernardo is dead. The girl runs into her bedroom and begins to pray. Mother of God, I will do anything. Make it not be true. In the mirror, she sees Tony climb in from the fire escape. She spins around and punches him. Killer, killer, killer. She breaks down in tears and Tony tells her that he did try to stop the fight. He asks for her forgiveness so he can go to the police. She refuses and tells Tony to stay with her. It's not us. It's everything around us. Tony tells Maria that he will take her away where nobody can come for them. Together, they sing There's a Place for Us. There's an interesting musical note here. Bernstein was never formally a student of Copeland's, but met him as a young man. Copeland sponsored him in a way, informally. But Bernstein later said Copeland was the only real composition teacher he ever had. And somewhere, my God, that's Copeland through and through and through, yeah. right? Those, those transitions. So that shines through. And this is another reason. I mean, I have a great admiration for Bernstein. Copeland is... You're the Copeland man. Copeland is a great composer. The, possibly the greatest American composer of the 20th century. Copeland, if you consider innovation, I don't want to get too off track. Maybe Glass, maybe Reich. I could talk about this all day. But that just somewhere, it comes out of nowhere. You're like, my God, this is, this is 1940s Aaron Copeland through and through and through. The Jets convene in what appears to be a garage. Many of the group are jumpy following the previous night's violence. 
They want to bust and get even. Their new leader, Ice, tells the gang members that they should stay cool. Anybody arrives and tells Ice that Chino is hunting down Tony and has a gun. Ice tells the Jets to fan out across the city and find Tony before Chino does. And that, folks, is the end of part two. Interestingly, Ice was a character created for the movie version. And Cool was probably the most difficult and painstaking scene to shoot. The ceiling was very low and it got very hot inside. The dancer suffered pneumonia, torn ligaments, sprained shin, splints, scrapes, burns, dehydration, mononucleosis, making it the shooting with probably most incidents on set. The dancers famously made a bonfire with their knee pads in front of Robin's <laughs> office. Maria, the film has been described as a festival of overdubs. If I understand correctly, Jimmy Bryant sang for Richard Bremer, Tucker Smith sang for Russ Tamblin, but Russ Tamblin sang his own Officer Kropke. Is that right? That's correct. Because Tucker Smith was good at imitating Russ Tamblin. So the musical director decided that he could use that in the recording. But what is mostly heartbreaking is that Natalie Wood thought that her voice would have been used. So she took singing lessons. She just made a duet song with Frank Sinatra. So she was uh, pretty confident about her own singing skill. And all the production were always saying how great she was. And by the end... <laughs> that's Hollywood. <laughs> that's what they yeah, do. That's Hollywood. How naive you. can you get? Uh, she was a pretty frail person, <laughs> let, let's put it that way. Uh, so she would wonder why Marnie Nixon would be present in the recordings. And they would say that they would later on mix her high notes with Marnie Nixon's high notes... And she clearly bought that because she was very, very disappointed and, and had a bitter experience by that. And Money Nixon was also playing a second role, correct? She was playing the part of Anita when uh, Rita Moreno was not available for recordings. So Anita's voice is a mix of Rita Moreno, Betty Wand, and again, Marnie Nixon. Right. And she was also being in the voice of My Fair Lady and The King and I. Marnie Nixon. Yes. I see. Well, Marnie Nixon sang, yeah, the big solos for Anita, right? Yeah. And the very unfair thing was that uh, Marnie Nixon was not included in the contract in terms of royalties. And for the previous things, for My Fair Lady or The King and I, she wouldn't say anything. But this time around, she wanted to fight. And at the end, it was not possible. So Leonard Bernstein gave part of his royalties to her to make it straight. But the irony of the thing was that it did cover just the albums. So when CDs came on and oh, really? the, obviously, West Side Story's soundtrack was still selling, she didn't get any of the royalties from the CDs. Interesting. I, I had no idea. That, that that's an interesting clause. In a con- Be careful the way your contracts are worded. Mm-hmm. Bernstein later famously, his daughter wrote in her, in her recent memoir, but throughout his life famously was unhappy with the film, didn't like it. And it's easy to understand. If you ever want entertainment, you can get on YouTube and find any number of Bernstein rehearsal videos. And the man, even when he was drunk and dexedrine off his ass, was a perfectionist to, I don't think that's unfair to say, but he knows I love <laughs> no, the guy. But, you know, it was just the way you said he, it. But he you know, was a perfectionist. And it just, he has this way, like, what he's saying in his demeanor sounds friendly, but you can just sense the exasperation. And he's such a legend by the later part of his career that just the, the way people crumble. Is, so Except for his producer, and I don't remember his name, but watching the... Uh, the oh, Tecano the guy from work, Deutsche Gramophone. Yeah, um, that, yeah. That, is, that is fantastic because well, he actually puts Bernstein in well, his that, place. That guy, interesting story, he worked with two notorious figures, great conductors, but he worked not only with Bernstein, but Karajan. Mm. But that guy retired afterwards because he, he just kind of thought... I, he had worked with Bruno Walter earlier, then he worked with Karajan and Bernstein, and then said, I'm done. Nobody else is going to live up to these guys. Anybody else would have been easier to work with, I'm sure, than those guys. But Bernstein was unhappy with it. He was such a perfectionist that there's no doubt that, I mean, I have no idea how much say Bernstein had over what happened in the film. It appears not much, if any. But I'm going to say that he might have very publicly torched it if they had not brought in other singers. Well, music-wise, it was already recorded mm. by Johnny Green. Right. Uh, so the interesting thing was that Johnny Green was very excited to have Lena Bernstein comment on the recordings because it was like 72-piece orchestra. It was a very big recording. But he was infuriated 
because he was super slow. And what Johnny Green never told him was that the request came from Robbins because he wanted the music to be more danceable. <laughs> Obviously, it was re-recorded. Bernstein was famous, uh, particularly as he got older and older uh, later in his life, for he, you know, Obviously, he was a welcome guest at every concert anywhere in the world. Mm. But the man I would mean, not he's the, de- he's the definition of raconteur. Right, right. Would, throughout concerts, would talk and comment on them to his assistants people throughout the concert, throughout the show, or would, uh, according to his assistants, would sit through the show and kind of gesture from his own seat as though he could control things like slow down, slow down. So he'd make these hand gestures, even though he's sitting in the audience. And people dealt with that in different forms. There's a famous story at the Barbican in London in the 80s that Bernstein's sitting there, again, probably intoxicated, talk, talking to his assistant. Allegedly. No, no, no. I think that's pretty Allegedly. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to dispute that. He's talking to his assistant throughout the performance, and somebody turns around and talks to him and says, will you shut up? And no one had talked to Bernstein that way ever. <laughs> so, so he's just amused by it. And then later it... it uh, I don't remember what theater. I think it might have, again, been the, the Barbican, but sitting in a box, and someone puts it more diplomatically and says, hey, you know, uh, Maestro, there's an acoustical quirk wherein anything you say in the box can be heard throughout the hall. <laughs> 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 but it, it probably, the, the man was not subtle in any way, uh, good or bad. Right? So while, while we're doing sort of random facts, are you familiar with Clive James, the Australian presenter? Oh, yeah, yeah. On YouTube, seek out the Rome episode, I think it was, where he actually sits down and has a chat with Bernstein because that's awesome. It's, a, it's like everything that you would expect from Bernstein. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's had a few. He's, uh, he's holding court. I mean, one thing that the overdubs cannot really take away is the lack of chemistry between the leads. Natalie Wood and Bayman just don't look like they're actually singing to one another. She's thinking of Richard Wagner, maybe? I think she really was offended by the fact that he was not cast. The source for that is the million notes that Wise would take about the casting. He would have the person that was auditioned and notes on it. And so we know that Robert Wagner was auditioned. And I think Natalie Wood hoped that her star power could do something about that. Maria, Robbins only ever shot something like four scenes before he was barred from the studio lot. Um, What exactly happened? Well, let us just say that the prologue that was shot in New York should have taken three weeks and it took two months. That gives you an idea that Robin's style was very demanding, very meticulous. And not a great shooting ratio. Not a great shooting ratio. The average shooting schedule was expected to be two to four script pages per day for roughly three minutes of screen time. Still, by October 1960, when Robbins was fired, the amount of usable footage shot per day was one script page and under one minute of screen time. Every dance was repeated from the top. So even if that particular dance was not to be shot, but it was danced and it was rehearsed anyway, and there were multiple, multiple takes where Wise would be okay with it, but Robbins would want to redo it. In wise word, a Robin style was very demanding, very demanding, very demanding. Do it again, do it again, do it again. It was wondrous, exasperating, sometimes maddening. So the production gave Robbins and Wise a lot of warnings, but Robbins was firmly stuck to his own style. But he was printing everything, right? He was printing even copies with glitches because he wanted to take a look anyway. Yeah, I can imagine doing that. I can I can totally imagine, like, I want to see everything. Let me put it all in front of me, and then I'll work it out. Yeah, he was like, I may use it. Yeah, I may use it. Sounds like me with this show. <laughs> so needless to say, they were monstrously late and way over budget. The dancers recall Friday night when they finish one number. I think they finally finished Cool. And Robbins went into one of his famous tantrums, and he screamed, Anyone can be replaced. Anyone can be replaced. But what they found out on Monday it was that Robbins was replaced. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. It's amazing in a way to me that even the, the stage show ever got made, to say nothing of the movie, because you have Robbins, Lorenz, Bernstein, like all three of these guys are perfectionists and just massive personalities. Like, yeah, they're how, some egos. <laughs> yeah, how they ever got anything done. I mean, 
if you're in a group where Stephen Sondheim is the the quiet voice. Well, I was, I was going to, you know, I was watching an interview with Sondheim. I'm glad you brought him up. I was watching an interview with Sondheim just yesterday where he was talking about being a collaborator and the, the importance of collaboration to him. And yeah, he's actually the odd one out in this group. He definitely seems like the, the of that quartet, as much as I admire Bernstein, the one you'd actually want to spend time with is Sondheim because he Absolutely. seems like a decent guy. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's right. <laughs> Well, let's move to part three of our story. Tony and Maria lie in bed at her apartment. Clearly, nothing untoward is happening because Maria is in a negligee and Tony is wearing jeans. Anita arrives home, grieving for Bernardo. When she finds Maria's bedroom door locked, she knocks and asks to come in. Tony kisses Maria and gets dressed. On the other side of the door, Anita hears them whispering. The lovers agree to meet at the dock's store. There, they'll be able to get the money to leave town. Tony exits via the fire escape stage left. Maria opens her bedroom door to Anita. No fool, Anita immediately looks out the window and sees Tony running away. For a brief second, we see him in silhouette, stopping to talk to anybody. Anita shouts at Maria. He's one of them and sings a boy like that. Maria responds with her contrasting half of the duet, I have a love. The duets tend to play quite well. It's just, I'm stuck on the the, uh, chasteness of the scene, right? It's Romeo and Juliet. This is the wedding night. It just strikes me. It's not Zeffirelli. Right. That's exactly what I was going to mention. It's because it's not even seven years later that Zeffirelli has 15 year old Olivia Hussey and Leonard Leonard White naked in the same scene. There's a difference in filming in Italy in 1968 and filming in America in 1961, but. Huge difference. Trust me. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you Europeans. So ahead of the curve. Crying now, Anita tells Maria that Chino has a gun and will kill Tony. Maria is able to convince Anita to help the lovers elope. There's a sudden knock at the door. It's Lieutenant Shrank. He wants to question Maria about last night's fight. Maria protests and asks Shrank if it can wait. The lieutenant insists on questioning her now. Desperate, Maria sends Anita to the docks to let Tony know she's been detained by the police. And there's that incredibly forced dialogue in front of the lieutenant. Do you remember? It's like, go to docs. I need something for my headache. Remember that whole thing? And it's like, you you people, remember he said, but it's really an opportunity for Shrank to say, you people, you never have this stuff around your house. Right, right. At the docs store, the Jets are discussing Tony, who's hiding below them in the docs basement. The doc, meanwhile, is upstairs raising money for Tony's escape. I was kind of surprised that this doll's house staginess was retained for the movie. Anita arrives at the docks and asks where he is. The Jets sarcastically tell her that he's gone to the bank. She then demands to see Tony. I want to help. I have a message for him. Suspecting a ruse to lure Tony out of hiding, the Jets tell her that they don't know where Tony is. Anita is set upon by the Jets. It's a nasty scene, the staging of which has to walk the line between sexual violence, gang rape no less, and what you could do in a big-budget Hollywood musical. The attack only ends when Doc walks in and shouts at the Jets to stop. Reeling, Anita shouts at the gang members. Bernardo was right. If one of you was lying in the street bleeding, I'd walk by and spit on you. She goes on to give the Jets a message for their American buddy. Tell him that Chino found out about the couple. He shot Maria. Moreno is never better than in this scene. That scene and that acting of Rita Moreno, I think, is the best thing in the film. She is absolutely brilliant there, isn't she? Uh, I was reading that to film that, she kind of got into crime moments. She could not calm herself, and Wise had to stop the shooting for a moment. And then she decided to take a walk in the large studio, but then she wouldn't come back. And later on, they found her. She was entangled in cables. (laughs) 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 <laughs> but the the thing is that the scene and the evolution and the arc of Anita, I think this is the real newness of West Side Story, something that Shakespeare doesn't have. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Right, yeah. This, so interesting that the nurse character was updated into Anita, essentially Tibble's girlfriend. It's also the, just this part of it, that this central plot element that Romeo or Tony needs to think that something has happened to Maria this makes so much more sense than what was in Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> it's so much less elaborate. Well, it's very economical. Right. It is. It is. But it works and it's believable. And it's easy to see why you don't need a big elaborate miscommunication or anything. Just you have a quick moment where they tell her, well, Chino shot her. 
and then it also plays into that that whole uh, the honor culture element of gang culture. Having shouted at the Jets for their violence, Doc sends them away and goes down to see Tony in the basement. The Doc erupts when Tony talks about naming all his future kids after him. He hits Tony and shouts, Is this the only thing that'll get through to you? Crying, the Doc tells Tony that Maria is dead. Tony rushes out onto the street and shouts for Chino to come and get me too. Tony finds his way to the basketball courts from the beginning of the movie. Through a hurricane fence, he sees Maria, who shouts his name. They run into each other's arms. Of course, this is the fateful moment. A shot rings out as Tony is struck by Chino's bullet. Both the Jets and the Sharks come running from all directions. Tony dies in Maria's arms, but not before Maria sings a few lines of somewhere to her dying Romeo. Maria stands and takes the gun from Chino. How many bullets are left? Enough for you and you? Now I have hate, she says. How many can I kill, Chino? She drops the gun and collapses crying. Lieutenant Shrank appears and Maria shouts, Don't you touch him. She kisses Tony one last time before a group of jets and sharks carry his body away. A funeral march plays out the scene and we're left wondering if the truce brought about by Tony's death can last. Yeah, that ending with Maria singing somewhere is the more powerful version of it, I think. She sings like two or three lines. Right, but the, it, it just works, right? Yeah, it's, it does. I like simplicity. I like brevity. I like but the this, ephemerality of a great tune. Is this really is, is, though, the downer ending. I think it's one of the, the reasons, perhaps, why the studios were reluctant to get involved with the film and why Mersh had to come and rescue them. It's not a feel-good musical. How many musicals can you think of that end in this way? Not many. This is where I'm torn. On one hand, I understand it, that it was an upbeat genre, that that's what they wanted at the time. On the other hand... It's Romeo and Juliet. Come on. Sure. Your audience knows And you've got it. a built-in audience because so many people saw it on Broadway. Right, exactly. Yeah, and it's not tragic enough because there's now the double suicide. So exactly. It's, mm-hmm. Leonard Bernstein used to say that he cried out for music. So I think he tried to compose something like Puccini-esque to comment the moment, but it didn't work. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's a little bit frustrating as an ending because in, in the case of Anita, you have her American dream shattered by the aggression and her arc is pretty understandable. But for Maria, it's like, okay, so probably it shed a light on the fact that her character's whole identity is based on being accepted by a man or shall I say a white man. So when this doesn't exist anymore, then she's kind of left like a light that's been put off. That's always what I feel is like something is lacking Interesting. I wonder, yeah, I do wonder if, if it could have worked in the opposite direction mm-hmm. if, if Tony had been Puerto Rican. In, a, in the way that this wound up paying a lot of Bernstein's bills and he became unhappy with it, the Supremes for years in their stage show, although I don't know if they ever put it on an album, used somewhere. But in the milieu of the time of the 60s, right, everything has to be beaten on the head and made super, super obvious. Mm. So they used to have a spoken monologue in the middle of the song, usually delivered by Diana Ross, that they would change from show to show about current events. So as though you didn't get the metaphor of somewhere being about other issues, they explained it to you. Um, This is not a time of subtlety. There are a few versions you can find online. One I think they did on the Dick Cavett show after Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. By the way, everyone, watch all of Dick Cavett. Dick Cavett's great. (laughs) It's the best. Yeah, and I'm not... Fact check, I'm not sure. I think it was Dick Cavett. It might have been Carson. I think it was Dick Cavett. After Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, where they, you know, like, as though you didn't get it, but they would stop and explain it. As you can tell, I'm not a fan of the spoken monologue in the middle of the song thing. Burr Lives would have the greatest Christmas album of all time if he didn't have to stop and tell you about the Bible in the middle of every song. <laughs> it was I, a very, very, very 1960s thing, right? You have the drone, you just people go, ooh, and you stop and very serious and tone of the mic. Somewhere there is a place for us, a place where we can have peace among like that kind of thing right (laughs) oh is that what you're trying to get i I did because i wouldn't have figured that shit out because i'm even dumber than i look i think we have our cold open (laughs) (laughs) well let's turn to the film's legacy the film was nominated for 11 oscars and won 10 including best picture and best director both for wise and robbins Interestingly, Robbins would never again direct a picture. Wise, meanwhile, would have a second musical success with The Sound of Music. 
perhaps borrowing from Robbins, that film would mix real-world locations with old-school Hollywood studio sets. No, I'm sorry. He was quoting himself. He was quoting the aerial shot, which were his idea, and then substituting them with castles and countryside. And spinning nuns. Yes. Well, after The Sound of Music, Wise suffered the biggest flop of his career, the film Star, a 1968 musical starring Julie Andrews as the stage performer Gertrude Lawrence. He bounced back in the 1970s with two science fiction films, The Andromeda Strain and Star Trek The Motion Picture. After that, he retired from directing. But he had one final crack at the musical genre, coming out of retirement to direct 1989's Rooftops. While the film ostensibly shares DNA with West Side Story, it failed both at the box office and with critics. This synopsis from Time Out gives a few clues as to why. Orphan T lives in an empty water tower atop a deserted Lower East Side tenement in New York. In fact, there's an entire community of kids up there who hang out by night in a vacant lot named the Garden of Eden, peaceably sorting out their differences through combat dance, a stylized descendant of the Afro-Brazilian martial arts discipline capoeira, which involves no physical contact. Enter serpent-like trouble in the form of neighborhood pusher Lobo, aided and abetted by nubile young Elena, with whom our hero is besotted. Time for teen love torn apart once more by divided loyalties. So, Maria, this sounds like your kind of film. Well, actually, I do love Capoeira, but this film I found on YouTube a VHS trailer, and frankly, I'm not that tempted. And Bernstein would continue to write musicals. However, his final musical, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in 1976, was the last attempt to write a Broadway show because it closed after just seven performances, Garrett. I think he had an ambivalent relationship with, with musicals and musical theater. His great ambition was to write the great American opera. Opera, yeah. He was not a shrinking violet. Early in his career, he said he might be the ideal person to write it. He had the idea for this vernacular, and he's not wrong there, but he never did. As time went on, his relationship to his own success in musical theater, particularly West Side Story, was strained because he thought that it overshadowed his more serious work, whether that's his symphonies or his mass or his, his other vocal works. There's a great quote from Robbins, actually, about, from, I think, his autobiography, where he's talking about 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And he says, Lenny never learns. He fucks around with Christ, God, and his country, forgetting his best work came out of looking warmly at life around him. He sees himself as sage, prophet, Einstein, and it all gets stuffed into large and important pieces. They come out hollow and sentimental. There are a lot of conductors and a lot of other composers who wondered aloud, even during Bernstein's lifetime, if he hadn't stretched himself too thin. His constant conducting engagements, his public engagements, even taking on things like 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, what opportunity cost was there in terms of his serious composition that he never did write that opera that I think everyone agrees he could have? Candide's definitely better than repertoire now. Yeah, but Candide was also in the 50s. Candide was at West Side Story. And, and Candide was not that great American opera. I think everyone would agree. There's always that what if. Where can you have both, right? Could Bernstein the celebrity, Bernstein the conductor, have coexisted with Bernstein the, the composer that he could have been? And it seems like in that equation, it's the compositional half that maybe was left unfulfilled, that there's potential left there even later in his life. Because it would have required, for most composers, it requires a period of intense concentration and, and not doing other things. Yes, you could say that you know, the likes of Mahler conducted throughout his career, but he also had times of isolation to write. He wasn't in the mid to late 20th century, right? Mahler wasn't doing television programs. For <laughs> not, that, not that he necessarily would have. But we would watch. <laughs> oh, hell yes, I would watch a baller television program. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Maria, what happened to Robbins? Robbins didn't go back to Hollywood. Actually, the two Oscars that he received, he put it in the basement. He said, they're fake as Hollywood. <laughs> and wow. so he went back to choreographing. And I think in 1980, he did a revival of West Side Story. And Lawrence? And Lawrence in 2009 did his own version of West Side Story. He wanted to fix two points. One point was the gangs were not menacing enough. And one thing that he wanted to give more voice to the sharks. 
And in order to do that, he decided to translate part of the dialogues, especially the Sharks dialogues, into Spanish and involved Lin-Manuel Miranda to do the lyrics for at least two of the songs, one of which Sondheim was pretty happy <laughs> to let be translated into Spanish, which was I Feel Pretty. And also A Boy Like That was translated into Spanish. But I think in a subsequent version, they were sung again in English. Garrett, do you think the film stands up today? I mean, in some ways, it, it's a musical. So the central point is not so much the story. The story is Romeo and Juliet. That stands up. The music, of course, it stands up. The actual film as an artifact, perhaps not. And this is where we get into a tension between, is a film of a musical supposed to be the musical or is it supposed to be a film? And these are two very different things, I think. In the realm of film and of pop music, for example, it's unusual in, in all of human artistic history because a recording is the urtext. Mm -hmm. Whereas for a musical like the stage production or a work of music or an opera, it's not. So you expect it to be brought back again and again, like we see with this new film of, of West Side Story. From the perspective of a musical, it's not a remake at all. It's just, it's a musical, so you're staging it again. You're just and restaging it. it. Right, exactly. exactly. It, it, that should happen, and it should be interpreted differently and performed differently. Yeah, as you would with any piece of theater. Right, and if it's not, then how disappointing and how sad is that if you have a musical that's not? But film's quite different, of course. So you have all the other elements there. How does it look? Uh, what angles do you use? What, what is the technology available to you that changes things? So it, I think it really, really depends. How well it holds up depends on, are you looking at it as a film or as musical theater? I think what is interesting is that it kind of crystallizes Robin's creation on Broadway, probably because of Robin's big involvement. So it kind of, in our collective conscience, is very much how the Broadway musical is the way the film is. So, for example, I was reading about a tour in Japan in the 1970s or 80s, and Robin's himself came here. But everybody was disappointed because it was different from the film. <laughs> <laughs> There's something there about the popularity of a work like West's Story. There's also something there about concert audiences in Japan. On the subject of legacy, there are a couple of other kind of tidbits here I want to touch on. Director David Lynch is a West Side Story fan. Lynch cast both Russ Tamblin and Richard Beamer in the original Twin Peaks and in the subsequent 2017 Twin Peaks The Return. Tamblin played the eccentric Dr. Lawrence Jacoby, while Bamer played Benjamin Horn, who's the richest man in Twin Peaks. Mark Frost, co-creator of the show with Lynch, said that once we met Richard Bamer, we just couldn't resist the notion of reuniting them. So maybe it's time for Lynch to do a musical, Maria. Oh, juicy. Blue velvet or your razor head. So by the retroactive transitive property, Richard Bamer was a good choice. He, he turned out to be. The reverse Nick Cage principle. Like, Nick Cage can do whatever he wants because he wasn't raising Arizona. Put Nick Cage in a West Side Story revival. <laughs> <laughs> if we were that age group, yeah. it would have been crazy. I bet, yeah, I bet he can dance. Uh, so, Marcus, researching this episode, you also stumbled across a great Larry David clip on YouTube. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, check out the episode Officer Kropke from Season 7 of Larry David's Curb Your Enthusiasm. Apart from being wickedly funny, David makes the point that Crop You was originally supposed to be Fuck You, but the producers balked at the use of the F word because it would limit sales of the soundtrack. Well, not just the soundtrack, right? In the whole show, Sondheim has made the point that you needed to not only avoid the curse words without sounding like you're avoiding the curse words, but use slang without dating the show before it hits the stage or hits the screen. So you have all this kind of made up slangy sounding language in order to make things not sound dated, which had the also the so effect the, of making things sound dated right away. Yes, exactly. Like, cool. Can anybody listen to cool and not, it gives you a cringe. Like, I don't mind outdated slang, but it's so... Yeah, and it doesn't go it's far so enough. Awkward. So my thing is that it doesn't go, it's not like Anthony Burgess. It's not going far enough right. into a made-up language. Right. Yeah, exa that's a brilliant point. I, I wouldn't have thought of Burgess, but that's a great comparison. Like, if you're going to make something up, lean into it and make it up and... Yeah, you know, go full yeah, clockwork yeah. orange. Has that ever been made into a musical? It must have, right? <laughs> it's so wrong. I love it. It's got to be. It's got to be. It's got to be. It, this has a, a bit of the producers in it, doesn't it? The a little bit of ultra violence <laughs> on stage. Okay, well, I think David's bit is still on YouTube, and we'll link to it in the show notes. Of all these different co-authors behind the film production and the musical, Sondheim comes out looking pretty good. 
Within the world of musical theater, absolutely. I think... Is, song, it, is it just because he lived the longest? No, no, I don't think so. I think it's because musical theater was his, his milieu, right? Musical theater is what he was passionate about. That's what he wanted to do. I don't think it's unfair to say that Bernstein was falling back on musical theater, that he aspired to something else. That's not where his heart was, right? And Robbins Lorenz, it's a little bit different because Lorenz wrote books. Mm. Uh, Robbins was a choreographer mostly. But in terms of Sondheim started off, as far as I can tell, his whole life, right? Wanting to write the words and the music. Yeah. And he had a... He had a, a pretty clear direction. It's right. there in every it, interview. It, as we learned, I mean, at the time of West Side Story, perhaps nobody knew it. But by now, for us, we know that he had a, he had a vision. And it was specifically about musical theater. And it was about what musical theater could do and what kind of subject matter could tackle. So I think in terms of completely changing, perhaps more than anybody else, maybe even single-handedly, what kind of subject matter musical theater would tackle, I don't think it's overstating anything to say that nobody has been more influential on the musical, at least in the post-war era, than him. Well, I think it's time to turn to Steven Spielberg's remake of the film. Is it a good idea, Maria? I don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea. It's like, is it necessary? Do we need... Who, who's clamoring for it, in other words? Yes. Gary? I don't know who's clamoring for it, and I don't really know who it's for, right? So on one hand, it's a musical. Yes, of course, we make it. That's what it's for. We, we've talked about some of the limitations of the 1961 version, the film version, right? There are issues of brown face. There are issues of how corny it seems to have gangs fighting. There are issues of the performances and who's in there. So, yeah, of course, remake it. That's what it's for, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those themes are never going to go away. I mean, the the themes of, you know, two houses divided and, right. and, and those are, street, yeah, street Romeo violence. Juliet's lasted over 400 years for a reason. And he also decided to keep it in the time capsule of well, the time. That, that is interesting to me. So the, mm. the decision to keep it in the 50s and to keep it there seems to me – Take this as a you want to use missed opportunity, don't no, you? No, 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 no. Quite the opposite. It, call this a cockamamie theory. Like it's specifically intended to redress problems from 1961. Like he's fixing mm. something mm. rather than updating it or anything else. He's going back and saying there is a version of this show that could have been committed to film that wasn't, and we're going to fix that. Now, I'm making that interesting. Up. Uh, interesting. I like I like this theory. Now, By the way, I um, mean the last time I talked to him, he didn't mention that specifically, but just. Uh, <laughs> Pop quiz, what was the last Steven Spielberg film that was set in the present? E.T. Oh, it was a bit later than that. Oh. Any ideas? No. Maria knows the answer. The Terminal. He's oh, been shit. doing historic films, or at least films that, set been... in historic periods yeah. Yeah. all of this time for yeah. the last 15 years or whatever. And even The Terminal, I mean, come on. It was technically like a decade before, right? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> but the, yeah, I didn't, I didn't even think The Terminal. I, I would have never in – in like a month of sitting here, thought of the terminal. I do think that the film's themes are more relevant than ever. I mean, yeah. that's that's one thing that's going to no doubt work. Well, that's that's a question and, I had. And it's... Kushner's a brilliant, brilliant writer. Well, yeah. Clearly Spielberg is interested in the world of musicals. He was a executive producer of a TV series that I quite liked, and it stopped at two seasons, which was Smash. There was a story Smash. about musical Broadway actors, and it was very... Kind of a chorus uh, line. Yeah, a kind of chorus line about a possible biography of Marilyn. So, and, and it was kind of engaging with you know uh, Broadway stars like Bernadette Peters. and uh, So I, I can see his interest of giving his interpretation, his side of musical. But we've been talking with our uh, uh, spiritual and spiritual uh, alco <laughs> alcoholic mentor, <laughs> Tsuyoshi Yamashita, who is a bar friend owner, of the show. Friend of a show. And he was like, Steven Spielberg. Oh, okay. So um, it might be one of his last films. Why do this? I think it's yeah, a Yeah, it's an interesting makes, point. Like, yeah. of all the things you want to do, you know, you're in your 70s, do you want to remake West Side Story. And it was an interesting point. Obviously, there's an affection there. This is something that Spielberg knew early on. And I do think of it as, as him looking. There's got to be, like, for, for anybody who is that proficient and that knowledgeable on a subject, you have to be looking at other people in your realm and going, this is how I would have done that. And there's got to be an element of that, of, of him looking at West Side Story. Because it's a film that is beloved but has a mixed reputation, mm. That there's got to be an element of Spielberg going, it could have been. It could have been something else. It could have been better, 
And certainly with the casting, obviously, that's right, going to right. change. And th- it has certain elements that are maybe risk-free, really low risk, right? And again, this is the Bernstein part. How bad is it going to be as long as you don't fuck with the music? That's true. Well, for those eagerly awaiting the Spielberg remake, and that's you, Garrett, West Side Story 2021 edition will be released in the US this Friday, 10th of December, and here in Japan on February 11th. So I'm not sure if you saw the same interview with Rita Moreno that I saw, but she said that for something like seven years after the film, she didn't get any kind of leading roles. Yeah. Moreno thought that the Oscar would mean finally access to all roles, not just those ethnically characterized parts. But she said that the situation got even worse. But let's not forget that she is an EGOT. So she got two Emmys, a Grammy, an Oscar. And most interestingly, her Tony comes from a play called The Ritz by Terence McNally. And the character she played was based on an alter ego, a caricature that Moreno created to entertain herself and friends on the set of West Side Story. The character was called Googie Gomez, an amateur entertainer with a thick Puerto Rican accent, a creation that allowed Moreno to laugh at stereotypical representations of Latinas in Hollywood. Talk about owning your narrative. Yeah, owning it. Okay, Maria, take us home. (laughs) Well, I think that West Side Story is really the chemistry of, in a way, compromise. We have so many like geniuses at work, Bernstein, Lawrence, Robbins, Sondheim, and it's clear that they wanted it their own way, and they try to do that afterwards, or with revivals, with orchestra versions, but it didn't work. So it means that they achieve perfection in the adjusting each other to the right angles, the right well, compromise. The- it, it worked. It just never had the same impact, right? Exactly, exactly. So I think this impact comes from really aligning of the stars in a way with the, the zeitgeist, with the um, the taste. In our cinema in Paris, it ran for three years consecutively. And there is someone who saw it 64 times in his life. So it means that it achieved really the magic. It found its audience. Before we wrap up today, I want to thank you, Garrett, for being on the show. Now that we've established you as our go-to music correspondent, I hope you'll grace us with your presence again soon. There are so many obscene Bernstein stories I didn't get to tell you, so yeah, I do hope to come back. Well, I knew this recording was going to be fun when you asked if I'd like my whiskey PT. Thanks, too, to the person who does more than anyone else to make this show happen, Maria Suzuki. Thank you. And see, Maria, we never once sang your name. I appreciate it. You've been listening to The Last Picture House. Be sure to let us know what you think of the show on Twitter, where we're at Last Pick House. Follow us on Facebook or on Instagram, where we're at Last Picture House, one word. And we'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks for listening. 